Welcome to the Healing Pain Podcast with Dr. Joe Tata. Each week, we interview top experts in physical therapy, pain science, and integrative pain care. You'll learn the most up-to-date information for treating and reversing persistent pain. This podcast is for educational purposes only and not intended to be used as personalized medical advice. And now, here's your host, Dr. Joe Tata. Hey there, friends. Welcome to this week's episode of the Healing Pain Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Joe Tata. As always, I am delighted and honored to be spending this time with you this week. A couple of weeks ago, I recorded an episode on embodied cognition and the body's role in thought with psychologist Rebecca Fincher Kiefer. And in that episode, we discussed the importance of using the body as a therapeutic tool for helping modulate difficult emotions or difficult thoughts that people may encounter from chronic pain or other various chronic health conditions. Now, of course, as physical therapists, using the body as a tool for healing from pain or other conditions, whether it's physical or mental, is a big part of what we do. So on this week's episode, we're going to go deeper into how to use the body, including how to use exercise and physical activity to improve pain, as well as mental well-being with Dr. Jennifer Heights. Jennifer is an expert in brain health. She's an associate professor and Canada Research Chair in Brain Health and Aging in the Department of Kinesiology at McMaster University. She directs the NeuroFit Lab, which has attracted over $1 million to support her research program on the effects of exercise and physical activity for brain health. Her award-winning research examines the effects of physical activity on brain function to promote mental health and well-being in young adults, older adults, and individuals with Alzheimer's disease. She has a new book coming out called Move the Body, Heal the Mind, which examines the latest research on how exercise can help you overcome anxiety, depression, dementia, improve focus, creativity, sleep better, and yes, even improve chronic pain. Okay, without further ado, let's begin with Dr. Jennifer Heights and learn about how we can use exercise and physical activity to improve brain health. Hey there, Jennifer, thanks for joining me this week on the show. My pleasure. We're excited to talk to you because we love talking about movement and we also love talking about the brain. And you happen to have just authored a great book on how moving the body heals the mind and the brain. So we're excited to hear all about that. But tell us, I mean, as a physiotherapist, like this is just so exciting for us, but tell us how you became interested in that intersection between movement and studying the brain and exercise. Yeah, it, well, it happened a while ago when I was in graduate school studying uh, fundamental neuroscience, actually. So how does the brain represent who we are? So how does it form memories and create them? And it became clear that something wasn't going right with my own brain. I was having pretty severe anxiety and wasn't getting any help that I wanted from the medical community. So on a whim, I borrowed my friend's rusty old road bike and was amazed that the movement really soothed my mind. It quieted my mind. And from that point forward, the movement became a central focus for both my personal life, but also my professional life. So I shift my focus of research to not only study the fundamental neuroscience, but how exercise as a stimulus really uh, evokes all these fascinating things in the brain. Yeah, what I love about your work as I was going through your book, it's much more like, you know, when people, for some reason, there's still this, what I consider a stigma attached to exercise. It's like, well, you're going to exercise to have stronger muscles or bigger muscles to be more flexible and to look good. And like, that's the end of the conversation almost, right? Mm -hmm. So I love people like you who come in like, okay, let's take the conversation much, much deeper, Mm -hmm. obviously for people who are struggling with physical and mental health challenges, but even us as professionals, like I think even even as professionals, we go to school and we learn about all these um, topics and mechanisms, but yet we haven't quite learned how to have a conversation in a way that the average person is, oh, exercise is much more than just becoming sweaty. Mm -hmm. How How have you started to kind of weave this in with, obviously you have research subjects, but you must be talking to them kind of one-on-one about the importance of exercise. Yeah, and I I think one thing that sets my book and my approach apart is that it it really does take this compassionate approach to exercise, not just for the body, but for the mind. And when we start talking to people who are, you know, who are struggling with issues, whether it's anxiety or depression, you know, it's 
exercise is almost the last thing they want to do. And in, in a research study we conducted right at the beginning of the pandemic, we surveyed over 1600 people and there was, it, it was interesting actually, because there was a shift in what, why they wanted to exercise. So it was getting away from looking good and moving towards feeling good. But there was a, there was a bit of a catch 22 because uh, we call it a mental health paradox because people wanted to work out for their mental health, but their anxiety and stress were getting in the way and they lacked the motivation, which is a symptom of depression. And so we really need to approach movement differently when treating people with mental mental health issues or um, who are struggling at the moment. And one of the sort of the mantras I think people should should adopt is, you know, some is better than none, you know, and consistency is key. So, you know, less away from like intensity and more towards consistency. Mm. Why is it so hard for, because people have heard this message before, right? Exercise mm -hmm. is good for you. You should exercise. I think the American College of Sports Medicine guidelines, which are similar worldwide, about maintaining at least five hours of exercise a week for your health, but yet it can be really hard for people to begin an exercise program. Mm -hmm. Why is it so hard for people to kind of get that stimulus to begin, so to speak? Well, when you look at that number, um, you know, the ACSM put out that number and it's big. <laughs> if you're starting at zero, that's quite intimidating, right? So um, we actually did a, a review for the ACSM Sport Fitness Journal, and it turns out you can get by with a lot less for your mental health. And so I think actually what we could do is get people moving for their mental health and then sort of they'll build up this feel good feeling around exercise, get into the habit, and then we can layer on what they need to do for their physical health. That's and interesting. That, so so should ahead. we have like a separate set of guidelines for mental health and exercise specifically? Yes. Yes. And in fact, it's much, it seems to be much less than the 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous activity or the 75 minutes of vigorous activity per week. It seems to be much less. And, and uh, so this is something that we are on a mission to do is develop these exercise guidelines for mental health or brain health. Um, yeah. So we're, we're, we're in the NeuroFit lab, we're building up the evidence to help, help generate these. And I think that's great news for people because those, as you mentioned, five hours seems overwhelming if you have a busy life with all, all of us too. And if you have a chronic health condition, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in context of our you know, podcast, we're talking about chronic pain, but many people have other types of health conditions where they say, I can't do five hours of exercise. So what, mm -hmm. where does that leave me? Yeah. Yeah. So there, I think there's two important conversations to have. One is that you know the brain prevents, it wants to conserve energy. So it essentially makes us lazy. So the brain, uh, you know, it evolved during a time when we had to expend a lot of energy to hunt and gather our food. And that relic is still the brain, you know, in our modern day society, we don't have to do that. But, and so the brain wants to prevent us from expending any extra energy and voluntary exercise is seen as an extravagant expense. And so it goes out of its way to talk you out of moving. You know, oh, you're too tired. Do you even have time to exercise right now? And it's, it's uh, rebuttals are relentless, really. So um, first off, we have to realize that we are up against this inertia, you know, that's set up in the brain. And key ways, just super simple ways to get around that is making a plan and I mean, physiotherapists or physical therapists do this all the time. You know, they create a plan for their patients or their clients uh, where it, it denotes when they should exercise, what exactly they should do, block it off in the calendar and treat those as important meetings as any other meeting you have. Um, and so that's one of my go-tos personally to help fit it in despite my busy schedule. And that really helps people get over that initial biological inertia. But there's also, especially when it comes to people who are suffering from chronic conditions, there's this psychological inertia too. There's this fear and that fear can prevent them from moving in the way that they should. Um, and uh, 
I, I was seeing a physiotherapist during my training for, um, I've been training in triathlon lately. And uh, one thing that he mentioned to me was that, yeah, it, it's this fear that the, that people can't do it or that they're not an athlete or that it will hurt them that actually is blocking a lot of people from getting the help that they need. Mm -hmm. Right. Fear always is a factor, especially with chronic pain, but even just starting an exercise program, like movements can seem scary. Mm -hmm. um, the, the amount of exercise or the intensity can seem scary. A, a gym environment can seem scary to people. So you mentioned physios before. Exercise is kind of just part of what we do. And it's part of kinesiologists and personal trainers and lots of other health and wellness professionals. But when I look at the research on mental health, which I know you know really well, there's almost overwhelming research on exercise for mental health, specifically anxiety, depression, and even PTSD. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. The, the evidence is starting to really accumulate. It's, it's really profound. Um, the effects of exercise for certain depression conditions can be on par or even better than antidepressant medications. Exercise for anxiety treatment can be really beneficial. Um, it's actually can be even an exposure therapy for people who have anxiety sensitivity. So in, in a way, we can expose them to the, the, the somatic feelings of anxiety, like the racing chest or racing heart, the difficulty breathing, the uh, lack of focus that are symptoms of anxiety um, that can exacerbate it to a panic attack. But those same symptoms are present in exercise. When we're exercising vigorously, our heart races, it's hard to breathe. And sometimes, you know, it's difficult to stay focused and concentrate. Um, and so exposing people to those feelings in their body can actually help them co cope and tolerate with those feelings when they experience them outside of the exercise setting. So uh, when they experience them in an anxiety setting, like before they give a presentation, for example. So exercise can be a form of exposure, which we know, but you're saying specifically in the, in the context of um, anxiety or probably what we consider panic attacks, right? Mm -hmm, exactly. Yeah. Like so a panic attack often seems like heart racing, shortness of breath, maybe sweaty palms, sweaty temples, very similar um, symptoms that are going on. Absolutely. Yeah. So people with this anxiety sensitivity, they may not, they may not have uh, anxiety, like a full-blown diagnosis, but it, they could have uh, this sensitivity to the symptoms. And it's very difficult to get these individuals exercising. They don't want to. And if they do, they try to avoid any kind of vigorous exercise, even though it's really the medicine that they need in small doses, right? So um, in my book, I talk about um, using, using a more gradual approach. So the first part is like, uh, it, I call it the fear buster working workout and uh, I have people walk at a brisk pace, you know, and this low to moderate form of exercise has been shown to increase uh, neuropeptide Y, which is uh, a resiliency factor in the brain. Um, that, as you mentioned with PTSD, people who, who have more, neuropeptide Y or NPY are protected from developing PTSD. They may be exposed to the same trauma, but increasing a neuropeptide Y or having greater reserves of it protects them. And so we can build up neuropeptide Y with light to moderate exercise. And so I have this fear buster workout where they briskly walk to get the neuropeptide Y reserves up and then once they're feeling resilient, they go for a quick burst, you know, at high, high intensity. And this exposes them to those feelings that they fear the most. I like that. So a brisk walk, which can yeah. be about five or 10 minutes or so. Yeah. And then a burst of intense activity, which you've all heard of high intensity interval training. But yeah. how, how long of a, of a burst do we need for that group? It can how many, be how many minutes? Like 10 seconds. Oh, it can well. be seconds. Yeah. So the the all they need to do is have the heart up, you know, 
elevate the heart rate uh, to the point that it, it's, it's, it makes them feel uncomfortable. And so start with just a few seconds and then gradually add several more bouts, you know, so it's exposure therapy. It habituates them to the symptoms. Um, yeah. That's great. Yeah. So all the, all the PTs will try that because right now they're thinking, well, we could do this on a treadmill or a bike or maybe just mm -hmm. in, in the gym with Absolutely. A basic exercise. And, you know, there are definite, the reason why I love that is because there are, are connections between pain related anxiety, mm -hmm. or anxiety and pain, I should say that I think that's really useful for, I know it's a, a big uh, chapter in, in your book. Should we be at the point now where the first intervention for things like depression, let's say mild to moderate depression mm -hmm. should always include exercise instead of let's say antidepressant medications or even cognitive behavioral therapy, which CBT really is looked upon as um, the gold standard. But as I said before, the research is really interesting when you start to look at exercise. Yeah, absolutely. Exercise needs to be part of the initial conversation, especially nowadays when most people are experiencing symptoms of depression that are brought on by the chronic stress of the pandemic, of life in general. Um, and so uh, it's really important to have this as part of the conversation. And I think it's starting to change a little bit since the onset of the pandemic. But bef prior to that, it really was left out of the conversation. Basically, you would show up to your doctor's office and they'd hand you a prescription for antidepressants. The problem with that is that antidepressants actually don't work for one third of people who take them. So imagine going to the doctor, finally getting the courage to, you know, to admit that you're not feeling well, getting a drug, reluctantly taking it and it doesn't work and being so confused and feeling so helpless. And so I devote a lot of time in the book to talking about that because I think it's an important message that a lot of people don't realize. And for these individuals who are drug resistant, they have drug resistant depression, they're the ones who could benefit the most from exercise. And for them, exercise is the medicine they need far more than any antidepressant. Mm. I'm wondering how the mental health community has picked up on your work because um, their job is mostly sedentary. And mm -hmm. even though they're counseling on healthy behaviors, it's always interesting to me that they're counseling on healthy behaviors in the context of a sedentary behavior. Mm -hmm. That's true for chronic pain. That's true for depression. I'm just wondering how the mental health community is starting to say, okay, how might this research, right? How might Jennifer's research help inform or change what I do as a mental health professional? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, we're we're all on the same team. So <laughs> um, there's great research out. You mentioned CBT. There's great research coming out about how exercise can help to sort of bootstrap it or speed it up mm -hmm. um, because it, it does take a long time for CBT to start working. And for a lot of people, you know, it takes too much time. They don't have the patience to, to stick it out for it to be beneficial. So they see the benefit there. A lot of therapists talk about healthy lifestyle, which includes, you know, getting enough exercise, eating well and sleeping well. And these all are, are hand in hand. So with, with healthy mental health. So, um, yeah, the, the community is very open to this. Um, they're, they're, they are a lot, well, I mean, a lot of social workers or um, psychotherapists, they talk about this, you know, they talk about managing lifestyle, and they're there to help coach you through that. Of course, they don't have a lot of them don't have the skills necessary to prescribe exercise. And this could be a beautiful marriage between, you know, a physical therapist, and a psychotherapist. Imagine you go to a clinic that offers both and they work in tandem to get you moving more. Yeah, and more and more PTs are, are interested in um, mental and behavioral health, which is, which is great. And it's interesting because I always think, well, the primary aim or one of the aims of mental health is to improve cognitive function. Mm -hmm. And we know that exercise improves cognitive function. Yeah. 
though it is a really nice marriage. How does exercise help with our cognitive function as we age? Because that the aging aspect mm -hmm. is something that is of interest to a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. So um, we've done some work on this, quite a lot of work on this, actually. One of my favorite studies is we combined or we contrasted genetic risk for dementia versus physical inactivity and found that physical inactivity contributes to dementia risk as much as your genetics. And so I have this saying I like to say, you can't change your genes, but you can change your lifestyle. And it really underscores the importance of movement in protecting the brain. We've also done a study where we looked at um, walking, interval walking with seniors and compared it to regular walking or stretching. And what we found was interval walking in particular had an incredible boost on memory performance for seniors who were previously sedentary. So what does interval walking look like? And you go out for your regular walk and you pick up the pace to the point where it's difficult to have a conversation, you know, the talk test, right? And they repeat that over and over about five times for uh, approximately a 20 minute, 30 minute workout. And so seniors love that because a lot of seniors like to walk, right? A lot of seniors like to walk and just, I, I often say, you know, pick up the pace between light posts or add a few hills into your uh, loop because what these bursts of intensity do, um, and obviously it's relative, they're not going to go out for a full on sprint, but these bursts of higher activity help generate more lactate in the muscles. And this is some really cool research out around lactate is that, you know, we often think of lactate as this villain, this bad thing we want to get rid of, but it turns out lactate is one of the greatest promoters of neuroplasticity in the brain. So it moves from the muscles to the brain and stimulates growth factors like brain derived neurotrophic factor, uh, vascular endothelial growth factor, all these growth factors that help support the growth and function of the brain cells, in particular in the hippocampus, which is a key region for memory function and is also what is most damaged by Alzheimer's disease. That's a really cool feedback loop we have, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to figure that out from like an evolutionary perspective. So obviously movement has been with us through the ages. Mm -hmm. And I guess when there are bouts of higher intensity or increased intensity exercise, your brain is saying, okay, there's something going on here mm -hmm. that I should be paying attention to. So whatever just happened, that lactate is a signal to lay down, as you mentioned, new memory, neuroplasticity, new learning. Mm -hmm which is so interesting, I think, from a, the perspective of lots of different things. Yeah, yeah, I love the way you talked about that. So it's one thing we're doing next is looking at, you, are you familiar with orienteering? Yes. It's like, a, yeah, so it's, we think of this, so I have a, a expert orienteer in my lab right now, coincidentally, she's a grad student, and she, this is her project. So she's, she's having people do orienteering, bursts of activity while they spatially navigate, which is really essentially what our ancestors did to hunt and gather food. And so we think that this will be a really beneficial way to boost memory in older adults. That's so interesting. And I love the, you know, that population of um, older adults is so left out of the conversation oftentimes with exercise until maybe they're injured and then they mm -hmm. wind up like in a physical rehab setting. But I think obviously talking to older adults, not only about their physical health, their mental health, but their, their brain and their mem preserving cognitive function is, should be like the top of our list, I think with, with that population. Yeah. And they're, well, they're terrified of getting yeah. dementia. And unfortunately there's no cure. There's nothing that they can take. There's no pill that they can take. And so they're, they're constantly seeking ways to prevent it. And so older adults are, are really behind this. If you tell them it's, it'll prevent dementia and there's really strong evidence for this, um, they'll, they'll start moving. And, and there was a recent study just out a, a systematic review that said resistance exercise is especially important for older adults and to improve their cognition. And if you think about it, um, you know, it, it stimulates the muscles, but not only that, it strengthens the muscles, it improves mobility, and then they can move more, you know, they can walk more, walk easier, or take the stairs. Um, and so it really is the foundation for layering on top of that the intensity that they need to get the lactate up. Mm. 
another area in your book is on creativity. And I'll tell you a couple of weeks ago, I did like a three hour online workshop on how meditation can improve creativity. I do a lot of writing. So I'm interested in how can I just kind of, you know, increase my creativity. So I did this three hour workshop, but I've been meditating for, for decades and I didn't really have much of a change at all. Okay. <laughs> and coincidentally, when that whole workshop was over, I went out for a walk down to the Hudson River here where I live in New York City. And all of a sudden, thoughts just started like moving like really rapidly. And mm. when I wrote my first book, what I used to do is when I used to get kind of get like that writer's fatigue, I'd go for a walk, I'd feel refreshed, and I'd come back. So when I saw your book come over my email, and I started reading the creativity part, I was like, okay, what's the connection between movement and creativity? Because I'm a natural mover and movement tends to just increase my creativity levels more than anything that I've come across. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I hear you on the meditation too. I've been trying, <laughs> <laughs> I've been trying for years and I do find it helps actually, but it, it also is a really nice complement to movement and exercise. And so, you know, the mindfulness perspective, incorporating that in with your movement um, att attending to your breath, attending to the body. This helps sort of make the movement a, a mindful meditation, but you're actually moving. So it's a little bit easier, right? <laughs> I find at least. <laughs> and so the creativity piece is so interesting because it can just be a self-paced walk. Like you said, it can be only 10 minutes of a self-paced walk and it's enough to stimulate creativity. So the research is really looking at creativity from this cross training perspective. So, you know, when we're writing or when we're doing something intensely, we're doing one thing. We're not doing many different things and the brain needs to be flexibly shifting between things. So if you're sitting at your computer writing and you're in your stock, switching the context and going out for a walk is that cross training that you need to flip the switch so that you have some new ideas a fresh perspective on what you were writing so it's not blood flow because someone said oh you're increasing blood flow to your brain i was like well i do other activities that increase blood flow like lifting weights doesn't tend to increase my creativity much for some reason yeah. the walk and what you say with the you know changing multiple context and makes more sense to me yeah so it, it is partly um it is partly blood flow blood flow increases when we're sitting for long periods of time blood flow decreases so you know the that i found that when i was writing my book i was sitting for a long period of time and so you know the frequent movement breaks so every 30 minutes getting up for a two minute movement break and that could be a walk around the block but yeah it's it's this it's switching and why that works is the brain's executive functions have sort of two modes so one mode is inhibitory control and this helps you stay focused which is important but the other mode is mental flexibility which you do to switch tasks you know uh you know navigate your environment explore different ideas and this you need to stimulate uh, to, to have your creative juices flowing. So you mentioned writing a book, which you have a book out. As you're writing the book, I mean, you, you write for a living as well as a researcher, but when you write a book, you tend to sit for more periods of time. That's right. Do you, do you have any like aha moments of like, wow, this work is so important because I'm writing this book and I'm sitting and I'm noticing that things are changing? Because that happened to me when I first started writing a book. I was like, this is fun. I can put things on paper out of my head, but I realized, wow, like sitting really is not a very healthy activity for anyone. No. Yeah. And in fact, I sat so much that <laughs> I, I got stiff. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and I told you I'm seeing a physiotherapist because <laughs> now my mobility, you know, so this is kind of the irony. Um, so I ended up in chronic pain myself, uh, so I'm easing, I'm easing back into it. Um, but yeah, there, there were tons of aha moments. Um, well, I, I mean, while writing the book, I, it was just all consuming. You know, you pour your heart and soul into it in the hopes that it will really help others. And um, yeah, I hope, I hope it does that. Yeah, writing a book. I tell everyone, everyone should write a book. Everyone has at least one book in them. 
And just keep in mind, you're not going to feel great by the end of the book, <laughs> <laughs> or at least as far as your body's concerned. But it's mm -hmm. a really great creative endeavor for, for people. The last thing I want to touch on, which is important to the guests of our podcast, because we talk a lot about opioids, um, the research over the past year with the pandemic or so, is that opioid rates or usage has increased, at least in the U.S., by about 20%. And we were starting to decrease those rates, and now we see it back up 20%. Um, where should exercise or where can exercise fit in with addiction and recovery and re rehabilitation with that? Because, you know, obviously, if, if we're increasing, you know, opioid, opioids are just one um, pharmaceutical people have challenges with. But some of these people are going to struggle with addiction for the rest of their life. And they may or may not come across exercise as a means to help cope with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's just devastating, right? What what's happening with the opioid crisis? Yeah, it's up here in Canada too. Um, yeah, so I mean, prevention is always key, and I think we can target young people and get them moving more. Kids that are more active, physically active, are less likely to experiment with drugs, but after the fact, also, exercise is extremely beneficial for helping to speed up the recovery because it is, it's a lifelong process um, once the brain has a taste of, of addictive drugs and supernatural levels of dopamine, it's, it never forgets that. And so it is a lifelong struggle. But the, the really beautiful thing about exercise is that it does increase dopamine as well. It, stimul it stimulates the reward system and it helps to replenish it post addiction. So when we, when we become addicted to drugs, what happens is the level of dopamine in the brain is is not healthy it's too much and the brain needs to have a certain like it it's it's too much for the brain to maintain homeostasis so what the brain does it's so it's so incredibly smart it removes its receptors its dopamine receptors from the reward system and if if that drug can't bind to the receptors it can't stimulate pleasure and so uh what but the problem is now you need that supernatural level of dopamine to stimulate the reward system and feel good. Um, so natural pleasure, pleasures, natural things, normal things in life, like eating, you know, having sex, none of these give the brain pleasure anymore. And so um, when you take the drug away, they're left feeling really hopeless. Um, but when movement is coupled with that, it can help rebuild those dopamine receptors faster. And it can also help crush cravings. So even just a single bout of a 30 minute exercise, whether it be cycling or jogging or walking, um, crushes cravings for about 30 minutes or more afterwards. And so this gives the, that individual like a reprieve from, from, the, from the drug cravings. So exercise can start to turn the reward system back on yeah, because it's somehow shut down because we're putting too much of an external reward, mm -hmm. so to speak, into the brain or nervous system. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's too much. And essentially the brain seizes, it like locks down. And so exercise helps to open that back up, open the reward channels back up so that you could start feeling good in life again. Any idea uh, as far as how many minutes it takes once someone starts to move exercise for those reward systems, the parts of the brain to start to be stimulated? Mm -hmm. Well, I, it's very individual, but it happens faster. So, so naturally when you stop using drugs, the reward system will rebuild. Um, but from animal model studies, it shows that it takes, you know, one week of drug use, like this is talking about methamphetamine, but one week of meth use, it took one year for the reward system to recover. Mm. Four weeks takes four years. So what exercise does is it, it diminishes that recovery time. Like that's a long time. Mm. And so the problem with that long time is that slip ups can happen and relapse can happen. And so the, the best 
suggestions are to have exercise available in the rehab have facility, have it constantly supervised. Exercise seems to be extremely beneficial where they're working one-on-one -on -one with a personal trainer or coach. Um, and having this community of engagement where they have the social support around exercise and it creates this new exercise family that's different from their, you know, their unhealthy uh, life that they had before. Yeah, there is someone out there and I, I can't remember the website, but I think it's called Exercise for Addiction, actually. Yeah, um, there's a ton of programs. So in New York, there's uh, the Odyssey House has a Run for Your Life program, uh, which is amazing, yeah. you know, and it, it's just this community run. A lot of like former addicts, now athletes are have these available and they're just it's just amazing because it, it does provide not just like the neural support in dopamine but also the social support which i mean obviously goes hand in hand with movement and therapy for the brain too excellent jennifer it's been great speaking with you today on the healing pain podcast we love this topic of moving the body to heal the mind let our listeners know how they can learn more about you and follow you and learn more about the book Sure. Yeah, you can uh, order my book. It's available now for pre-order and will be released March 8th. It's called Move the Body, Heal the Mind, and it's available on all the online outlets, Amazon, Indigo, Barnes & Noble, etc. Um, yeah, I, I wrote it for, for you to help you. So I hope that it does. And if you want to learn more about my research, you can go to neurofitlab.com and you can learn about some of the fascinating experiments that we're doing in my lab. Great. So of course, all those links you can find on the show notes at the integrated pain science institute.com, but the website is neurofitlab.com and Jennifer's book is called move the body, heal the mind. You can find it on Amazon or any other online retailer. It's a great book. I encourage you to check it out and share it with your friends and family. I also encourage you to share this episode with your friends and family. You can do that really easy by going on social media, taking a screenshot, and then tag is pretty easy. It's at drjotata.com. And when you tag me, I'll be sure to tag you back. All right. And again, I want to thank Jennifer for joining us, and we'll see you next week. Thank you for listening to the Healing Pain Podcast with Dr. Joe Tata. To subscribe to the podcast and learn more, visit integrativepainscienceinstitute.com. That's integrative pain science institute.com. Sign up to receive weekly updates, leave a review on iTunes, and share this episode with your friends.